Secure Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al Clopine. Thanks for tuning in uh, today. Second hour. Well, I got 10 retirement statistics that will scare the crap out of you. Really? That's okay. the headline. That's okay. The... <laughs> Did you read it? No. Okay. No. You're going to read it now. Because I, I wanted to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> you, you wanted to sound like you're really, wow. And is... then I got some email questions. Okay. All right. So I'll give you a, a couple of um, these scary stats. Okay. Uh, let's see. You know, of course, these headlines it draws you in. I know, right? And then it's just all BS, yes. fluff. Yeah. Yes, I, right. Um, a good headline will draw you in, though. All right. Well, now, what do you think number one is? Uh, let's I, see. I got 10. So they're talking scary statistics on retirement. What do you think right. their number one thing number is? Number one is we haven't saved near enough money. You got it. Nothing saved for retirement. Oh, it's like kind of cheeky, too. Your mama have... Or may have told you to be happy with what you've got, but that isn't much if we're talking about retirement savings. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, you know, the last survey I saw, I think this was from Fidelity. One third of all people haven't saved a nickel for retirement. The nation's retirement savings gap is between six point eight and fourteen trillion. That's the gap. That's the gap. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see here. Finds the what? GoBankingRate.com. They find more than half of Americans have less than ten thousand dollars saved for retirement. Yeah, we have. With we've one seen that step. in three having nothing saved at all. Yep. Healthcare costs are sickening in retirement. Well, this guy just loves to play on words here. So according to Fidelity, it's depending upon which year. It's around $250,000 is the estimate for a couple who's age 65. That's out-of-pocket medical, not even including long-term care. You might be in it for the retirement long haul. Okay, that sounds like a bad thing. Once you hit age 65, roughly, your odds of living for another decade or two is quite high. Men age 65 today have a 78% chance of living another 10 years, while women have an 85% chance. Okay. You know. All good. Yeah. Once you get older, man, it's just like, oh, man, I got 10 more years of life? That, that stinks. <laughs> I'm ready to go now. Take me now. Okay. All right. Millions miss out on free retirement money. What do you think they're talking about there? Uh, free retirement money. Let's say Social Security. On average, uh, it's the match. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Millions okay. of Americans aren't doing themselves any favors, according to financial engines in independent investment advisors. Uh, independent investment advisor. One quarter of employees are not saving enough money to receive their employer 401k match. On average, these employees are missing out on an extra 1300 bucks a year. It's quite a bit. That is a bit. And so that's, you know, that's all about a 401k plan. You put a dollar in and your employer matches that dollar up to a certain point. So what you want to do is at least have enough in your 401k to get the match because that's free money. That's what they're talking about. The average 401k balance fell from $91,800 in the first quarter of 2015 to 87300 Huh. So. At what point? Like a year later? Yeah. Wow. Actually went down. Well, I think they're, they're, people are dipping into their. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Um, savings a little bit earlier than they should be. Could be. So, anyway, there's some some scary, scary statistics. Okay, there. that's pretty scary. All right, what else do we got? All right, I want to get into a few of these email questions. Okay. Um, because you know a lot of these sometimes people um, they have the same question. Yeah, sure. Right. This is with Advisor Insight Investopedia. Okay. Got so it. I help answer some of these questions. Got so it. I've never met these individuals. They don't go to Pure Financial okay. to ask these Just, questions. They yeah. go to Investopedia. Investopedia, and, and they, they ask, ask a question. And that's an and it comes, expert, comes to you? Yeah. Gets the email to you? Yeah. It says, uh, hello, Joseph. Below are a few of the latest questions that have been submitted for investors with your areas of expertise. Ah, okay. Nice. I don't think I have expertise in any of this stuff. <laughs> Can I roll over an old 401k 
to fund my children's 529 plan? Uh, no. Here, here's the summary. That was the title. Okay. The summary is, hi, I'm wondering if it's possible and sensible to roll over my wife's 401k, not mine, yeah. my wife's, <laughs> yeah. from a former employer with approximately $36,000 to 529 plans for our two children. I am 52 and my wife is 48 and our children are ages 9 and 4. We haven't started a 529 plan for either child, but have bank savings accounts for approximately 10000 each for each child. My wife has not been employed since having children. I'm employed and have approximately $400,000 in my 401k and pension accounts. Any advice you can offer would be greatly appreciated. All right. So first of all, there's no such thing as a rollover of a 401k to a 529 plan. That's the college savings plan. Now, you can roll an old 401k to an IRA, and that's tax-free. You know, that's still tax-deferred, I should say. But a 529 plan, that's a different kind of plan. So to take the money out of the 401k, you got to pay taxes and penalties because you're not yet 59 and a half. So which is probably between penalties, taxes, federal and state taxes, probably going to be at least 50%, I would say. So how about this? You could take money out of the 401k plan, roll it into an IRA, take the money out of the IRA to pay for college expense up to, what, 10000 bucks. 10000 bucks. That yep. would avoid the 10% penalty. Yes, you still pay so taxes So you still pay tax. Correct. Then you pay the tax on that 10000 bucks. Correct. And then you fund that into a 529 plan. The 529 plan then would grow tax free, right? Until the kids, until you use it for the kids' college education. The reason why people use 529 plans, if you're not familiar, each state has them, and you could pick any state that you choose. Um, it's just a savings vehicle that will allow all of the growth to grow tax free, just very similar to a Roth IRA. Right. Once you pull it out for qualified college expenses, then. Um, it's tax free, but if they don't go to college, you take it out. Then it's penalties and taxes. Sure. So you yeah. just want to make sure that how much that you're funding in this plan is, you know, not over funding it. Or if the kids don't go to school, if they go to the military, whatever, then that money is going to be taxed and, and yeah. penalized. However, one good thing about those plans, Joe, is you can change the beneficiary. So you've got maybe you have one for each kid, and one kid goes to college and the other one doesn't. That's all right. You can change the beneficiary for the kid that does go to college. Did you use five twenty nine plans? I did. You did? Yeah. What state did you use? Uh, I used Nevada because they had Vanguard, Vanguard? funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Utah's pretty good, too. They have yeah. DFA funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, California is Tia Kref, I right. believe. Right. So um, you just look around. If you want to utilize a 529 plan, if you know, all right, hey, I got three kids, and I know for sure one of them is probably going to go to school, sure. and I want to have some tax favor treatment on the 529 or on the on the savings, a 529 plan would yeah, be a pretty good way to go. Yeah, Joe, I think in, in your example there, I think the better approach would be to keep the money in the 401k. Well, maybe roll that to the IRA just for the reason that you said, but then it, they said that each kid, they have $10,000 of savings. Put that into a 529 plan and then start adding to it each year with available cash flow. That's right. what I would do. Yeah. So there's multiple things that you can do, and when it comes to an overall planning strategy, I think baby boomers now are looking at fighting right here of, all right, I got to save for retirement and I also got to put my kids through school and I also maybe have some elderly parents that, you know, might need some support and help yes. as well. And that's why having a strategy and plan is so important. So, you know, okay, I can only afford to save this. I can only, um, you know, uh, give my kids this and so on and so forth. All right, we got to take a break. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth right here on AM 760 KFMB. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al, hanging out on a Saturday, hour two. Thanks for tuning in. Go to our website, if you like, at purefinancial.com. Answering some of your email questions, or not yours, it was um, from Investopedia. Here's another one for you, Big Al. Okay. Can I use tax money owed from my IRA to pay credit card debt? That's the title of the email. Okay. I am pulling out $50,000 from my IRA for grad school. So I will owe about seventeen dollars in federal, um, federal and state taxes. I also owe about $15,000 in credit card debt. Does it make sense if I use the fifteen dollars to pay off credit card debt and then just pay off the government gradually, monthly, at a 3% interest versus the 9.4 that the credit card. Am I missing anything? Interesting question. So 
So he's going to take the money out of his IRA. He's not going to withhold any taxes. Okay. He understands, or she understands, that, you know what, it's going to be about a $17,000 tax bill to take this money out. Right. I have $15,000 in credit card debt. Sure. So maybe I don't pay the federal government right away. I set up a payment plan with the federal government, and I take that extra 17000 bucks, pay off my credit cards, right. or fifteen grand. Right, right. What do you think? I would never do that in a million years. No. No, would not do it. And here's why. Because, first of all, when you, when you like in, in this case, you're taking money out of your IRA, and that's a whole other you know, comment, which is whether that's a good idea for, for college. But let's just say that's the only course of action that you can do. You take the money out, and some of that's designated for taxes. And if you, I, I would much prefer that you, if that's the only way to pay taxes, you would designate, designate that to pay taxes and not have an issue. If you get behind with the IRS, and yeah, it's a 3% tax, uh, 3% interest, interest rate until April 15th. But then after April 15th, it becomes a 9% rate. And what happens is these things can snowball. And I, gosh, I have seen people get behind on taxes so much so that they never, ever get caught up. So, so if I file bankruptcy yes, and I have a $50,000 tax bill, is that yes. forgiven? Uh, it depends. I don't think it is, is it? It, it depends. It, yeah, it, uh, it if it's if it's old enough and if it's like an individual tax liability it can in certain cases. If it's a payroll tax liability it never goes away on bankruptcy. If it's recent it would not. Credit card debt of course does on bankruptcy. But yeah, no, I if, if it were me, what I would do um, I asked you a legal question, you're yes, a CPA, yeah. so I would throw well, you under the bus that, there right that, on well, the radio. That's all right. I actually kind of know the answer to that. But at, at any rate, <laughs> kind of. Kind of. That's, that's, don't, that's, don't take it to the bank. <laughs> so, 50, so, Big 50, Al said I'm not... Uh, 50, 50. Ba- ba- no. <laughs> but so, so here's the thing. I would much rather have you pay the tax liability when it's due and have the money ready and available for that and not not get into a payment plan with the IRS and then come up with a reduced spending plan to pay off your credit card debt. Yeah, I think you got to take a look at the overall picture here. Right? Do you have equity in your house? Do you own a house? Do you have equity? Maybe you pull something out. Maybe you do a home equity line of credit that um, potentially could be tax deductible. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, I would honestly say pulling money out of your IRA for college is, is not a suggested way to go. Well, he's going to grad school. Mm-hmm. That fifty thousand is gonna be chump change because you get the MBA. True, he's true, true. Five hundred grand. Yep. Um, yeah, he's gonna get an MBA in sociology. <laughs> That's a master's of business administration in sociology. Yeah, you mean like a that. master's of sociology? Um, okay, <laughs> shut up. All right, here's another, here's another question for you. That's smart. Okay. Uh, here's the title of it. Okay, I'll we, try not to answer the title. I'll we want to sell my parents' house. And my sister just wants to take over our payments. Do we get any of the money that we've already put into the house back? Hmm, interesting. Okay. Summary here. Yes. All right. My husband and I bought my parents' home several years ago with the financing done through my parents. We want to sell the house now, and my sister is interested. We have made about $30,000 in payments with $60,000 remaining in the note. I'm confused on how that would work. Okay. So, so let's summarize this maybe a little bit better. Yeah, I didn't quite get that. So, all right. So husband and wife bought mom and dad's home. Okay. It looks like mom and dad carried the note, okay. right? Said, okay, so, buy the house. Right. Okay. We're going to carry the note so, for you. Um, so, so in other words, that mom and dad sold it. And the child didn't have enough money to buy it outright. So mom and dad said, oh, that's all right. We'll act as the bank and we'll carry back a note and you just make us payments. Correct. Okay. So they want to sell the house. Okay. They, um, they've only put $30,000 in payments. Okay. But then the sister's like, wait a minute. I would like to, to buy. Okay. So she's wondering, hey, can I get that $30,000 back <laughs> of what they put in to give to mom and dad? Uh, it is dep- what I'm thinking. I think you just if it depends if it's interest or principal, right? Because of the, I mean, it's family. I think it's like all right. Well, here, mom and dad, we, we didn't. They just said, hey, why don't you just pay us? Right. I guarantee this what happened. I'm yeah. assuming. <laughs> mom and dad have the house. They're like, all right, we're gonna sell the house. No, no, no. We need a place to live. Can we buy it from you? Okay, sure. It's two hundred thousand dollars. Well, we don't have two hundred thousand dollars. All right. Well, you know what? Why don't you just pay us a couple thousand dollars a month? We'll carry back the note of two hundred thousand bucks. Right. Right. So they move into the house. It's two hundred thousand dollars. Maybe it appreciated in value to two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. 
right? And they put in $30,000 of their payments, right? So they made maybe one or two years of payments, and they're like, you know what? I don't want to live in mom and dad's old house. I want to sell it. Right. Sister now wants to get into the picture. Says, no, I want to buy the house now. Sure. But mom and dad still carried the note. Right. So it depends on how big of a note that mom and dad is still carrying. You put the $30,000 in. So if sister's going to come in and do that same deal, it's not going to work. Yeah. She's yeah. going to have to come in with capital to buy the house outright at whatever the market value is. Because it's gone up in value. Because, or, yeah. or, you know, maybe it didn't go up in value, but they ate $30,000 down to create that equity. Yeah. So. There's probably not enough information in the question. There but, is but, zero information but, but let, here. Let's, to, let's, <laughs> just, let's just say that $30,000 was, yeah, let's use your example, 2000 bucks a month. That's Maybe that's what mom and dad said. And so so then you then you got to look at it and what was the interest rate and what's the principal because there should have been a formal note set up. Probably it wasn't, but let's just, here's what you're supposed to do. Right. You set up a note and let's say out of that, that $2,000 payment, uh, Fifteen hundred dollars is interest and five hundred is principal. I'm just making that number up, right? So now we have whatever we had a couple of years of payments, whatever whatever it works out to be. So a couple of years, twenty four payments, five hundred dollars per payment. So that's about twelve thousand dollars of principal. So if you bought the home for two hundred thousand with no money down, now you paid off twelve thousand dollars of principal. So now you basically owe mom and dad one hundred eighty eight thousand. Now it's worth two twenty five. So if mom and dad are willing to carry the note to the child number two. Well, child number two needs to pay child number one the difference between 188 and 225. That's how it's supposed to work. Right. There's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> sister wants the same sweetheart deal that sister got. Yeah, yeah. It says, no, well, let me just take over the note. Well, wait, I put $30,000 in. They probably never even changed title. Right, yeah, right. All that stuff. No, it's basically rent. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Just have formal agreements. So yeah. Actually, that is, that's the most important advice here is when you do a, a family transaction. I know it may sound weird, but do it legally. Do it properly. Change title. Do an official note. Have regular payments. Show that everything was done above board. Right. And, then, and then you'll know when you're ready to sell or get out of this deal, it's really clear who gets what and how this works. And then let's say if, if, if kids can't afford the deal. All right. So I'm mom and dad, right? And then my kids want to buy the house. And so I form, uh, I, I, I have a formal note in place, right? Interest rate, payments, titles change, things like that, right? So you do a transaction normally, but then you want to help the kids out because it's like, well, they can't afford the note. Well, then you just gift them the money to pay the note, sure. right? So let's say it's $2,000 a month, right? So that's $24,000 a year. Well, you could give $14,000 per person per year. So if you're married, right, or maybe I'm single, but they're married, right? So that's 14000 for daughter and son-in-law. That would cover the mortgage payment in a sense. So I'm just carrying the note, but it's a sure. gift. Yeah, and interestingly enough, the IRS says... Even if you don't pay interest, you have to pretend like you paid interest. There's a minimum amount. It's called the federal applicable rate. Right now, it's what? depending upon whether it's long term or short term, it's around a percent to three percent, something like that. Where you, and this is what's kind of weird is you never even got payment from your child. You still have to record it as if you received that three percent right. or whatever that interest rate is. And Joe, that's where taxes get tricky and people throw up their hands and, and they give up. And but the truth is, if you know a few simple strategies, you can end up saving a lot of taxes in retirement all right we gotta take another break show's called your money your wealth right here on am 760 kfmb now back to your money your wealth on talk radio 760 kfmb hey welcome back to the show show's called your money your wealth joe anderson big al clothesline hanging out thanks so much for tuning in um go to our website at purefinancial.com get more information about us go to our podcast too at itunes um, subscribe to the podcast. You'll get it magically on your device, your smartphone. And uh, if you'd like it, give us a comment. If you don't like it, give us a comment. Right? We'd like to improve. Yeah, we, we do need your suggestions. Yes, we, because but, we are awful. But be kind. <laughs> <laughs> don't be too honest. <laughs> oh, I got one that could stump the big man here. I got an, we're, we're answering some email questions okay. uh, that, that, that come in. I'm on, I don't know where, where they found me, but I'm on this list where they, a bunch of people ask email questions, and then they send them to me for me to answer them. Okay. And I usually don't know the answers, That's why you, so, I read them on the on, air. Uh, so I read them on the air for Big Al to answer them. <laughs> so, okay, um, here's the title of this email. Could I convert my IRA to Roth and use the interest tax credit to reduce my tax liability on the transfer? 
Okay. All right. Summary. I currently have a reverse mortgage, which I will close as a result of selling the property. Okay. I understand that in the tax year I close the reverse mortgage, I will get a tax credit for the accumulated interest. However, as I'm retired, I pay very little tax. I do have an IRA, which I would like to convert to a Roth IRA. Okay. I like that. All right. And that's it. So he's curious that he's going to have a little bit of a tax credit because of the... Um, so he's, he's, what he's saying is on, on his reverse mortgage, and in the year it closes, I guess, right? So there's going to be accrued interest, but the accrued interest is from the future. So I don't really quite understand that question. I mean, in other words, you get a reverse mortgage, and, and it's either a lump sum or a payment stream. And then what happens is, is depending upon how much you take out of the mortgage, you start accruing interest, and that interest just adds to your loan, right? And so then when either you pass away or if you sell the home, that's when the, all that accrued interest then you know that's that's when you have to pay for it and that's when it's typically deductible now maybe he's referring to in some cases there's some upfront costs on these things and and some of that could be considered a accrued interest so maybe that's what he's referring to right if that's the case, if, if, if it's actually a payment, yeah, that, that if it's a payment and it's, it's, it's like legitimate, like points or something like interest. Well, well, all right, so let's just assume it's a tax credit. So he's right on the tax credit because that's where it gets a little blurred. Well, there's no tax credit for this. I know, but yeah. assume that he had a tax credit. Okay, <laughs> for something else. For something else. <laughs> because. <laughs> okay, yeah. So the, the answer is yes, do the Roth conversion. Yes. Because you're in a low tax bracket. And then if if I have a tax credit and if I do a Roth conversion, will that tax that I pay on the conversion in the credit that I receive, will that offset? Yeah, they do offset. So let's do a, let's see maybe a more real example. So you get solar power, right? You spend $30,000 for solar power, which would be cheap. But let's just say you do. And the credit is 30% of that 30000 So the credit is $9,000. So... Can you do a Roth conversion that's going to cause you to have to pay $9,000 of tax? Can you offset that credit against the tax? The answer is yes. And again, here's the conversion is this, is that you have money in your 401k IRAs and qualified plans. When you take dollars out of those, those are taxed at ordinary income. A, a conversion, a Roth conversion, is taking dollars from that 401k account and converting it into a Roth IRA. You do have to pay the tax when you do the conversion, but all future dollars are gonna grow 100% tax-free. Right. So if there's ways that you can take money from the 401k or IRA and move it up to a Roth and offset the tax with the tax credit, that's pretty good planning. That, that's great planning, Joe. And, and the other thing that's related to this, and this is really relevant to a lot of people, is I've just retired, I'm living off savings for a few years. I, I'm not going to be 70 and a half until, you know, five years from now. And I, I'm going to wait on my Social Security. I've been listening to Joe and Al. I'm going to postpone it to get a bigger benefit. And I'm enjoying really low tax brackets. In fact, I don't pay any tax whatsoever. So here's the thing that you want to do is take a look at what's in your IRAs and your 401ks and figure out maybe I should be converting some of this to a Roth IRA while I'm in really low brackets. Why not fill up these lower brackets? Because I'm going to be in a much higher bracket later. So in other words, I'm prepaying some of the tax right now. There's no way around the tax, but I'm prepaying it when the taxes are lower. It's kind of like buying something on sale. You go to the store, you buy it on sale. Same idea with the taxes. You're buying the taxes on sale. If you don't do that, what happens at age 70 and a half is you end up in a much, much higher tax bracket, and you will have wished that you would have done this Roth conversion. We, we see this missed all the time. Huge. I mean, we saw like net operating losses, million dollars. Remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah. And then he went to an advisor or a broker in a sense and said, yeah. hey, can I do a, a Roth conversion? They didn't even ask for the tax return. Yeah, they said your tax bracket's too high. And he has a, a million dollar net operating loss. So in other words, uh, at least on the federal side, he could have done a million dollar Roth conversion and paid zero tax. Zero tax. Zero. Because he had a couple million dollars in the retirement account. They're like, well, if you convert that, you're going to you know, pay. Yeah, you're and then, No, and then the, he showed us the analysis. It was a, They used 25%. Yeah, they just assumed he was in the 25% bracket. <laughs> if, if you're converting a million... 
<laughs> you're not in the 25% bracket. You're not in the 25% bracket. tax bracket. So first of all, in his case, he was in the 0% bracket because he had a million dollar net operating loss to carry forward. By the way, that's if you have a business loss or something like that in a year and you can't use it against your uh, other income. You can either carry it back two years or you can elect to carry it forward 20 years. So that's what he did. He had this, this $1 million net operating loss to carry forward, which means the first million dollars of income on his current year return is taxed at zero because those two offset. Could have done a Roth conversion for a million dollars paid no tax. And that would have been a really, really smart thing. All right. Um, I got one more, and then, um, then okay. we're going to get out of here. Um, this is, I haven't read any of these, so they could come off. Um, <laughs> That's all right. These are real questions. What can we do if my ex-husband is trying to get his 401k to cash out from his previous employer, but they are refusing to give it to him? Oh, really? So he wants to cash out his 401k from his old employer, and the old, old employer says you can't. Um, is that what, he, that what I'm hearing? I think so. How can my ex-husband get it if he has been unemployed since January okay and they is i'm assuming the employer yeah are also refusing to let him get unemployment help he really needs the help we have two small children and he hasn't been able to take them on his required weekends because he hasn't gotten a job and he can't buy food um for them or for himself so can you give me any help? So I like I'm trying to break this question down. So part of it is he's trying to get is he trying to get unemployment? And, um, I think both. He benefits. wants a four hundred one k out of his pre yes. previous employer, and he wants and he also wants to get unemployment. Now, did it say he got let go? Or did, or did was that part of it? Well, here, but yeah, he lost he got, his job. Lost his job. How can my ex husband get it if he's been unemployed? Well, I, I'm well, see, I'm he, guessing he's not unemployed. But, yeah, I'm guessing that too. They kept him on the books. Yes. And they're not giving him unemployment. They gave but, him a leave, and he can't take the 401k out because he's still an employee. Oh, I bet you're right. Cause he's got to quit. Yeah. If he quits, he doesn't get unemployment right. benefits, but he can get his 401k at that point. Exactly. Yeah, right. So he's fighting it and saying no. And he, he wants him to f he wants them he, to fire him so he can get unemployment, unemployment benefits. But then if he gets unemployment, then it goes on their... In, uh, their premiums probably yes. get. Well, of course. Then they have to pay higher unemployment insurance. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a little quandary there. <laughs> a contact an attorney. That's right? Yeah, really. Or else he quits. I mean, I mean, he's the, not going to get unemployment. I mean, it, but if you can't get food, right? That's what it says. He, he can't afford food. Okay. And then she wants him to get it out because she's stuck with the kids on the weekends. Yeah, right. She wants, to, she wants, she wants to go out. <laughs> But I thought he wasn't working at all. He can be there on the weekends. But he, well, he can't afford food. Well, for the kids or for himself. Maybe she should. Maybe pay she for should it. get. Maybe she should get a job and po he can watch the pony kids. Pony up. <laughs> I don't know. He's got to quit, right? It's un. It's un unfortunate. Yeah, but, I, I think. Right. I, I think he's. Your they're playing right. the game with the employer. No, fire. Me. Fire me. No, no I'm not firing quit. you. Yeah, We're, we just we just have no work for you. But you're still on the books. Yeah. Well, no, fire me. <laughs> if, it, if that were me. I'd say, okay, for, I'm out. For your pride, right? Just, I will find a job tomorrow. Right. I will work any, right? If I if I can't afford food. If I need food for my kids. Right. Oh, yeah. It, there's, it, it doesn't say anywhere here that he's disabled. It just says he's unemployed. Yeah. Well, find a job. Yeah, you could put an ad on um, Craigslist and say, I'll walk your dog for $20 a day. And boom, you got money for the kids. There you go. Yeah. I don't know. A little harsh, but that's... <laughs> Well, let's 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 try to help the people. Yes, right. Get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Let it, um, we're going to stop with the email questions right now, <laughs> and we will switch gears. We're going to. Uh, we'll, we'll be back in just a second. Big Al's going to give me a quiz on taxes, um, and then we'll probably just wrap up the show and uh, enjoy the weekend. Uh, so stick around for the last segment. We'll be back in just a second. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al. Happy Saturday to you. Wrapping things up here. Um, go to our website if you like, purefinancial.com. Go uh, get on our uh, email list if you want to get on, well, what do we do, newsletters? Once a week, I believe, or quarter. I don't know. There's a lot of good information. So yes. uh, go to purefinancial.com. All right. Give me this quiz, Al. I've been 
trying to beef up on studying on this. AARP quiz called Tax Smarts. Number one question. What's the minimum amount of time the IRS recommends that I keep my old individual tax records? One year, three years, five years, forever. The minimum amount of time the IRS recommends I keep my old income tax records. I don't have to keep them, but it's recommended. Yes. Three years, probably. That is the correct answer, but I would say five is a better answer. And the reason, here's why I would say it, uh, is the state of California can audit you for four years, right? And plus, it's four years after you file, which puts you into the next year. So five years to me is a minimum. Anyway, but the correct answer is three. From That's what the IRS recommends, and you are correct. Boom. Number one. Done. How about Next. this? What should I do if I receive an email with an IRS return address? Do not reply to the message. Do not open any attachments or links to the email. Report suspicious correspondence to the IRS by forwarding the email to phishing at irs.gov. Or do all of the above, because the IRS will never send you an unsolicited email. Yeah, I agree with that. All the above. All the above is correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. They won't uh, call you either. Yeah, generally not. They will return a call yes. if you already have an agent that you're working with, I believe. Yeah, and here's the thing. If you ever get a call from the IRS, hang up, and then if you're afraid that, or you think maybe it's valid, then call them yourself to make sure you're actually talking to the IRS. Right. And say, yeah, this is uh, John Smith from the IRS. Uh, this is a badge, very important matter. Badge, badge number, badge number uh, 1768402. Um, in reference to we're, we're uh, about Alan. To, we're, we're about to take your because, house. <laughs> uh, we, uh, right. So you, you, you go, oh, yeah, hold on, I'm right here. Yes. Uh, and then hang up. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And okay. then you call them back and ask for John Smith. Right. And then say, here's my social, you know, right? Yes, correct. Go ahead. So if the IRS is auditing my tax return, what should I do? Run. <laughs> Change your citizenship. <laughs> Mexico's not far. That's not on the list of okay. possible answers. That, is a, that was a joke. Yes. Well, Provide the requested material. Open any additional correspondence from the IRS immediately. Don't be hostile or rude in your communications or all of the above. All of the above. Of course. Yeah. Come on in. How can I help you? You want some coffee? Sugar? Cream? That's a very nice suit you're wearing, Mr. Smith. You know, I just love the IRS. You oh, guys man. are just so good. Oh, God, okay. I, I feel that I just need to pay more. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this for you know, quite I, some time. I give to charity, but you know, I'm just thinking about, can I give you guys a couple more bucks? Yeah. And that might help your audit, right? It could. <laughs> Okay, taxes are often not withheld from which of the following types of income? Taxes not withheld. Yeah. All right. You know, like salary, they have withholdings. Sure. So which of these uh, is typically you don't have taxes withheld? Alimony, gambling winnings, capital gains, all the above? All the above. You are correct again. I didn't know that alimony, but... Well, al yeah, alimony is that just goes that just between you and your, your spouse. ex-spouse. And, and gambling winnings, that's kind of surprising because the, the, the casino pays you outright, and they also get your information and do a 1099, but they don't withhold any money. And guess what? Your gambling winnings are taxable. But you know why they don't withhold money? Because how many times have you seen gambling losses to it's the extent a, it, of it, yeah, it's the same every, number every time? Every single time. In other words, you're allowed to deduct gambling losses to the extent of your gambling income. And if you ever notice, uh, if, if you gamble yourself, if you get a 1099 that says, oh, $20,000 of gambling winnings. It's a funny thing how on, I think it's line 28 of the itemized deductions, it says, uh, itemized deductions, miscellaneous itemized deductions, not subject to the 2% rule. Gambling losses, $20,000. It's just, a, I've actually never seen a return that didn't have those two numbers the same. So an itemized deduction that's not on the 2.5% rule is gambling losses. Mm -hmm. Do I have to have gambling wins to offset? Or will that yes. offset against no, ordinary income? No, no, you have to have gambling winnings. How about if I have $40,000 of gambling losses, no winnings? Then it's lost. You, you're out of, out of luck. It's like you're stupid. <laughs> you're not going to. It's get called any. gambling. Yeah. What do you expect? Right? All right. All right. If I donate my car to charity, what amount can I claim as a tax deduction? The amount you originally paid for the car minus your expenses for fuel and maintenance, the fair market value of the car, if the charity sold the car, the actual price it got, otherwise the fair market value, or nothing. Congress has barred deductions for all internal combustion vehicles. I don't know. I'm so bored with this. I wasn't even listening. 
the answer for those that were listening is if charity sold the car, the actual price they got, you actually get a 1099 from the charity that says what they sold. And sometimes charities will use the car for their own use. And if that's the truth, then it's the fair market value. Okay, you done with this quiz? How many more do we got? I thought it was like three questions. 25 questions. Oh, my no, God. No, I'm kidding. We got <laughs> two more. <laughs> Year, years ago, <laughs> I'm bored with it, too, actually. What else do you got? <laughs> We're wrapping this thing up early today, folks. Uh, wait, wait, before you do. I, yes. th- this is kind of interesting. 57% of Americans say their income taxes are too high. 57%. Okay. okay, 57% of individual it, it, Americans say their taxes are too high, but only 55% actually pay income tax. How can that be? That's that's what I want to know. So you're not paying taxes. It's, it's too, too high. It's too high. I'm paying way too much. I'm paying <laughs> nothing, but it's too high. That just uh, is crazy. But something else that, I mean, related to this, a lot of people don't realize, so do the math. 45% of all Americans pay no federal income tax at all. 45%. So the other 55% of us are paying 100%. Paying lots and lots in taxes. And if you look at, uh, oh, I don't know, the richest 20%. So in other words, the, the people that make the most income, the highest 20%, they pay about 87% of all our income taxes. The bottom 80% uh, pay, yeah, let's call it about 13, 14% of our taxes. So and and I I hear this all the time that the rich don't pay any taxes, and I can tell you I've been preparing returns for thirty years. That is not true. The rich pay a lot of taxes. In fact, from this stat, they're paying eighty six, eighty seven percent of our taxes. Everyone that makes is in the top twenty percent, right? Pays a lot of taxes. I, I'm here to tell you. Ton. So there's ways to mitigate some of it, not all of it. Yep. And so it's just making sure that you're doing things appropriately. I mean, Al and I, we talk to hundreds of people about planning for retirement every single year. Thousands, probably. You know, they're people just like you. People that live here right in San Diego, Southern California. And the same thing comes up in nearly every conversation. It's just like, I just, I, I don't want to lose any money. I don't want to lose one thin dime. I don't trust the stock market. I'm afraid of running out of money in retirement. I mean, does this sound anything like you? Do you worry about the same things? Do you actually have a plan? I mean, a real plan. Or do you wonder if all of the pieces to your retirement puzzle will magically come together? Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll be back again next week for another terrible show of Your Money, Your Wealth.